My topic this morning, as Betty has told you, is who is your master? And I wanted to read to you in a minute from an article which I was reading just coming down on the plane. I, of course, had my remarks prepared for this morning, but this article just fit in so beautifully that I'm going to read you a paragraph or two from it. But first of all, I just wanted to tell you about something I received in the mail last week. Maybe you got the same thing. A commercial from a department store advertising a particular new fragrance. And it was claimed that this is a witty fragrance, which sort of blows my mind. I've never thought about any perfume being particularly witty. And one that is uh, sophisticated, uh, debonair, I've forgotten what all the adjectives were. But the thing that really stuck in my crawl was that it said it makes a new statement about your sophisticated fragrance image. <laughs> I wonder how many of you have given much thought to your sophisticated fragrance <laughs> image. That seemed to me like the last product of absurdity. Then another commercial comes on our TV quite regularly in the mornings. You hear an alarm clock, and then you see a man <clears throat> leaping out of bed, racing downstairs, <coughs> gulping down his coffee, and flying out the door. And it says, the day cannot begin soon enough for the man consumed by a single aim. And of course, that aim is money. He is a beach broker. Then my husband and I last week were in a store called Bonwit Tellers. And I wandered around, as I frequently do in such a place, in a state more or less approaching despair because I don't happen to be a size six or a size four. And I look around at these things and I think, is there any designer in the world who has been aware of the fact that there are women over 22? And I don't find very many things there that look as though they were designed for anybody that is more than a size six. Well, what in the world have all these things got to do with the subject that I'm gonna talk about this morning? They're pressures that come at us from all angles, pressures that we would like to ignore. Sometimes we feel we ought to pay attention to them. This sophisticated fragrance image, this business of money, this business of how we look, how we dress. And it's very easy to fall into the temptation to arrange our lives according to the quotations of the day. What somebody else is telling me is important. Now, I'm going to reject that because I'm a Christian. I do reject it with all my heart. I will not be dictated to about who is my master. But it's a daily struggle. I'm bombarded from all sides as to what it is that really matters in my life. And every day I try to get my orientation again and ask what matters to me and what is it that I'm going to spend my time on today? What are my primary concerns? This article that I referred to is written by a professor of language and literature in a college in Massachusetts. And he's writing about the things that he wants to get across to his students and to his children. He says he has young children, and he teaches college students. And he says, I may press the question on myself as well as on my students and my children. What do I think I want? Where am I headed? There are numbers of answers, of course, and modern education beckons us in various directions. And then he goes through various answers. Money, for example, or more euphemistically, prosperity. Secondly, fame. If plain money seems a bit crass, then there's this, the desire for which is the last infirmity of noble minds. Or the beautiful life. Since life is so harrying and ambiguous these days, one may as well try to make it as amusing and dazzling as he can while it lasts. Or just plain security, stability, and peace. 
But he proceeds for several pages to show why these will not do as an adequate answer. And then goes on to give three or four answers of his own that are the things that he wants most passionately to get across to his children and to his students. And the third thing is the paragraph that I wanted to read this morning. I would like to keep alive in my students and in my children the capacity for contentment nay, for delight in the utterly ordinary. This is not going to be easy. It is the sort of thing one might encounter in such non-best-selling writers as St. Benedict and Brother Lawrence. It's going to be difficult because we and our students and our children are told in a thousand talk shows and a thousand books and in every journal and seminar and in every magazine and advertisement that what we want is something else. If you drive a Pinto, what you want is a BMW. If you drive a BMW, what you want is a Mercedes. If you shop at Kmart, you need to move up to Bergdorf and Neiman Marcus. If you go to Aspen for your holiday, you ought to go to St. Moritz. If you are a mother, you ought to be an investment banker. If you work from nine to five, that's a drag, and only dull people do that. If you are middle class, you need to get emancipated. Upward mobility, self-actualization, self-assertion, self-discovery, self-realization, aggression, kicks, travel, diversion. The beautiful people, radical chic. Anywhere but where we are, nothing could be as dull as this. How shall we preserve, he says, the capacity for contentment and delight in sheer, unvarnished ordinariness and routine, when this is the mythology coming at us so dazzlingly? To have caviar and smoked salmon dangled in front of my nose all the time has the effect of making me sooner or later think that the brown bread and butter on my plate is a bore, and that to be happy I must somehow get hold of caviar and smoked salmon for my daily fare. But caviar and smoked salmon are not the staff of life. They are wonderful garnishings, but precious few of us mortal creatures get them very often. The Caribbean is there, heaven knows, and it's beautiful, but have the advertisements for the Caribbean with willowy women and lithe men draped languidly on the deck of somebody's 90-foot catch with tall glasses of rum punch blunted my taste for walking through the woods to the local pond. Madison Avenue can, is doing what it can to bring this off and they know how to administer very effective doses of their magic. This is the first trip that my husband and I have made for about six weeks, which is really a long time in our schedule because we do a lot of traveling around and talking. And I can't tell you how I have reveled in six weeks of quiet, we live in a little house by the sea up in Massachusetts. We have a spectacular million dollar view and almost dead silence all day and all night. We can't hear a car. We hear the sound of the ocean. We hear a bird once in a while in the wintertime, not very often. I was delighted to awake this morning to the sound of the mockingbird. We have a wood stove, as one needs to have in New England nowadays, and so we hear the crackling of the logs and we hear the kettle, and that's about it. And I delight in that solitude and that silence. And what for me is routine, what for a lot of people would be boredom and monotony, is a precious gift, and I'm grateful. But I think the thing that gives me contentment is not that I just happen to be the type of person who likes solitude and silence. I can be content in Palm Beach, too. That's not too difficult. <laughs> I don't really mind getting on planes and sitting in boarding lounges and having time to read without a telephone ringing. I'm content because I know who my master is. I know what I want. And it's really only one thing. I'm going to tell you what that is a little bit later, but before I get to that, I'm going to go back over some of the reasons why I've had a chance to think about what it is that really matters in my life. And among the 
primary reasons are losses. Now that may seem very strange. But in every experience of loss in my life, I've had a chance to reassess what's important. The first experience that I can remember very vividly is the loss of my really only friend. I lived in Philadelphia in what is now a slum. We had 42 boys in our neighborhood and one girl. And I never played with that girl because we happened to be of different religions and her parents didn't like her to play with me and I didn't, my parents didn't particularly like me to play with her. And so there I was with 42 boys, but there was a girl about four blocks away that was my friend. And when we were both nine years old, she died. That was my first funeral. And I remember it very vividly. I had lost my only friend. Then, when I was a college student, I went to somebody's wedding, hung up my new black coat where everybody else hung theirs, and I happened to be a friend of the bride, and so I was one of the last people to leave. I stayed around, helped clean up the reception and everything, and when I went to leave, there was only one coat left. It was a black coat, but it was not mine. Somebody had taken mine. Well, it happened that this coat that was there fit me perfectly, but it was very old and very worn out. And so I had a hunch that whoever had taken mine was going to like it better and keep it, which they did. I prayed that God would get that coat back. And guess what? I never got it back. They seem sometimes like ridiculously small things, don't they? But in the death of my friend, although I was only nine years old, I prayed that God would teach me what he wanted me to learn out of that. And I prayed that he would give me another friend. And God did answer that prayer. He gave me several other friends. I was a missionary in Ecuador, and some of you who were here last year might remember that I talked about some other kinds of losses there, major losses. The first one being that all of the work that I had spent my first year on, language work, was stolen. This was in the days before Xeroxes and before tape recordings, and so there were no copies of anything. And I had been working on the reduction to writing of a language, an Indian language, which had never been written down. And all of those language materials were in a suitcase on top of a banana truck, which was one of our methods of transportation, just about the only method of transportation up to the capital city of Quito. And as happened quite frequently, all of the luggage of all the passengers inside the truck was stolen off the top of the pile of bananas. And I prayed then that God would get back that year's work. I had been called to be a missionary. I felt sure about that. God had given me a particular set of gifts which happened to be in the linguistic line and I believed that God wanted me to use those gifts for the reduction to writing of some Indian language for the purpose of translating the Bible. There are about 2,000 languages in the world that have never been written down and this means that there are people who speak those 2,000 languages who have no portion of the Bible that they can read. And so it was my desire to at least work on one of those languages. And I did that. I went in obedience to God. I found this tribe. I spent that year serving God, I believed, doing the thing that he had called me to do. And at the end of the year, the suitcase was stolen. And we prayed, of course, as any missionary would do, that God would find it for us and bring it back. It certainly wasn't going to do anybody else any good. The notes were in English and the Indian language. And unless you happen to be a linguist, they wouldn't mean a thing. God didn't answer that prayer. Or I should say he answered it with the answer that's hardest to take, no. That is an answer, isn't it? And so I went back again to those principles that govern my life. 
It was only about two and a half years after that loss. I had married Jim Elliott just a few months after that loss. And two and a half years later, Jim was killed. And as I stood by my radio then and heard the words that God spoke to my mind, not aloud, but he brought to mind words that I had memorized years before from Isaiah 43, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, for I am the Lord thy God. Now I had known that since before I was nine years old, that he would be with me, that he is my Lord, and Lord, after all, means master. And he didn't promise that I wouldn't lose my best friend, that nobody would ever steal my coat or my language materials, or that my husband was guaranteed to outlast me. He promised one thing, his presence. And I submitted myself to him because I knew he loved me. In other words, I was his subject and he was my master. And at each crisis, I asked the question, what is it that really matters to me? My friends, of course, matter almost more than anything else. My husband certainly mattered more than anything else in this world. That coat meant a lot. We were quite poor when I was a college student, and I suppose I got one coat every five years. And that language material meant more than I can describe because it was a whole year's very laborious work. But the thing that matters to me more than any of those things is the will of God. Because he's my master, I want to do what he wants. I want to do what he says. Now I'm sure that every person in this room has lost somebody and something. I don't know who you are and I don't know your stories. I know two or three people in this room and I know some of the losses. But we've all lost somebody or something. We've all probably been robbed in some way or other, if not literally having your house broken into. Maybe you've been pickpocketed. Maybe you have been robbed of your rep reputation by some malicious gossip or of your health or any number of other things that people do to us. We've been robbed twice, had our house broken into twice. The first time I lost all the heirloom silver, you know, the kind that can never be replaced. Generations of heirloom silver cleaned out. And this was only a few years ago, so by that time I had suffered losses which were much more serious, and I was able to say, well, they're only things after all, and that's what they are. Many of you here, I'm sure, have seen some cherished hope collapse, some piece of work destroyed. You've suffered pain and sorrow. I'm sure I'm not talking to anybody in this room that doesn't come into that category. And you realize when those things happen that you're not really very concerned about your fragrance image or whether or not you're a size six or even about your beige broker or whoever your broker happens to be. He was not able to fend off disaster, was he? Your perfume is not going to help you very much. And you know that there are some things that matter infinitely more. Does everything seem to be vanishing? Well, ask the question, who is your master? Is he one who is able to control and protect and direct and comfort? Or is he a hard master who does exactly the opposite and beats you continually and drives you 
and lords it over you. Well, there are, two, there are really only two classes of things, the things which are seen and the things which are not seen. And the things which are seen, the Bible says, are temporal. This beautiful chandelier is not going to last forever. This gorgeous house, this beautiful scenery, they're all visible things, gifts from God, not to be despised, but temporal, things of this world. And then there are the invisible things. And the invisible things, the Bible tells us, are eternal. Which do you live for? Money, friends, appetites, beauty, health, wonderful gifts, every one of them. And I thank God every morning for all of those things. It's a wonderful thing to have a good appetite, isn't it? One of the worst, one of the first signs of sickness is that you can't eat. And the things that you love suddenly become nauseating. And so God has given us not only wonderful things to enjoy, he's given us the capacity to enjoy them by giving us appetites. When I look in the mirror every morning, I am very much aware that something that every woman prizes is vanishing very quickly before my eyes. Whatever measure of beauty each of us has, we realize is a very temporal thing. And we frantically cast about for all kinds of methods of preserving it. And none of them work very well, do they? They're all stopgap measures. I want to read to you what Jesus said about this subject in Matthew 6. No one can be loyal to two masters. He is bound to hate one and love the other, or support one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and the power of money at the same time. That is why I say to you, don't worry about living. Wondering what you are going to eat or drink or what you are going to wear, surely life is more important than food and the body more important than the clothes you wear. Look at the birds in the sky. They never sow nor reap nor store away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable to him than they are? Can any of you, however much he worries, make himself an inch taller? I have to confess that I did a lot of worrying when I was young, wishing that I could be an inch shorter, and it never did a bit of good. Jesus is just illustrating very plainly and simply the utter futility of worrying. Have you ever managed to make yourself 10 pounds lighter or an inch taller or shorter or a size smaller by worrying? Can any of you, however much he worries, make himself an inch taller? And why do you worry about clothes? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They neither work nor weave, but I tell you that even Solomon in all his glory was never arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the flowers of the field, which are alive today and burnt in the stove tomorrow, is he not much more likely to clothe you, you little faiths? I woke up this morning thinking about those verses, realizing that it's been a very long time since I had to worry about literally having anything to wear. All we women are fond of opening the closet and saying, I haven't got a thing to wear, and you know how that is. But to be honest, it has not been a major worry. But I woke up this morning without my suitcase. We arrived at 3 o'clock this morning. We got to bed about 3 or 3.30 this morning because our plane was delayed out of Boston because of snow. And, of course, we had a different plane out of Atlanta. We missed our connection there which meant that our bags were not with us when we got here. And so this morning I woke up realizing that I was probably going to have to go to Betty Reed's house dressed in my wool suit from Massachusetts in which I left in the snow. Picturing the bright green, the pink, the beautiful whites, everything that I see in this room, I knew what it was going to be like and thinking, well, Jesus says, don't worry about it. 
Now, he doesn't say that it's wrong for me to wear a pink blouse and a navy blue skirt if I have one, mm -hmm. but he does say that it is absolutely wrong for me to worry if I don't. And he does promise to guide me and to provide what I really need. Many of our prayers are not for things we need, they're for things we want. Now listen to this. Don't worry and don't keep saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? This is what pagans are always looking for. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Set your heart on His kingdom and His goodness, and all these things will come to you as a matter of course. You can't possibly direct your energies in several different ways at the same time. You know how it is if you're in charge of the big ball that you're having here this week, or if you're in charge of a Bible class and you're going to have 50 women coming to your house in the morning, you cannot be thinking about 55 other things at the same time. You have to concentrate on one thing at a time in order to do that job. And Jesus is simply pointing out one of the hard realities of life. You can't be loyal to two masters. So if you're going to worry about these temporal things, these things that don't last very long, it proves who your master is. It's either God or it's this world. It can't be both. Set your heart on his kingdom and his goodness, and all these things will come to you as a matter of course. Don't worry at all then about tomorrow, he says. Tomorrow can take care of itself. One day's trouble is enough for today. I want to read also from the book of Philippians, the testimony of a man who believed what Jesus said and arranged his life accordingly. It was the Apostle Paul, one of his followers. He says this, I look upon everything as loss compared with the overwhelming gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord everything as loss. He goes on to say, for his sake I did in actual fact suffer the loss of everything, but I considered it useless rubbish. The most precious things in life by comparison with knowing Jesus Christ are useless rubbish. That's what Paul's saying. Not that Paul was not filled with thanksgiving for temporal blessings. He was. He mentions them over and over again. And he commands us again and again in his letters to be thankful. And contentment does not lie in despising what you don't have. Contentment lies in gratitude for what you do have. And contentment lies in receiving these things as gifts from God knowing that if they are gifts, the one who gave them can also take them away. And realizing that we can hold these things, as it were, on an open palm. Here, Lord, thank you. And any time you want to take them away, they're yours. But by comparison with these things, knowing Jesus Christ is useless rubbish. He goes on to say, now my place is in him, and I am not dependent upon any of the self-achieved righteousness of the law. God has given me that genuine righteousness which comes from faith in Christ. I'm sure I'm talking to good people. You've done a lot of good things in your lives. But that kind of goodness is like this chandelier. It's beautiful, we're grateful for it, we enjoy it, we enjoy you and your goodness and the things you do, but it will not last through eternity. And there's only one kind of goodness it does, and Paul talks about that here. God has given me that genuine righteousness which comes from faith in Christ. My goodness is not good enough for heaven. That I'm sure of. 
But if Jesus is my master, then he's the one who provides not only what I need in this life, but what I need in the next life, which is perfect righteousness. And so I submit to him. My testimony is the words of Paul in this same chapter, Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. He says, I do not consider myself to have fully grasped this even now, but I do concentrate on this. I leave the past behind, and with hands outstretched to whatever lies ahead, I go straight for the goal, my reward, the honor of my high calling by God in Christ Jesus. Straight for the goal. That is what gives my life a center, a purpose, a reason, a motivation. And it's what holds me serene, unmovable, and steady in the midst of life's worst blows. I've lost two husbands and the other little things that I mentioned. But in the midst of those experiences, I knew my master. He said, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. We sang trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. I trust him. He calls you this morning, he calls each of us to leave behind the frivolity, the trash, the vanity, the fear. How many of us are filled with fear? Anxiety, the worries, the endless and futile striving for things that are not going to last. And he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. <coughs> to follow him is to be qualified for heaven. It's also to be liberated forever from the bondage of this world. And this world is a tough slave driver. It will drive you to drink, to drugs, to cancer, to death. But Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. This master, my master, is the one who loves me. And I know that because he died for me. <clears throat> Who is your master? I'd like us just to sit for a minute in quietness, in a silent prayer, thinking about what Elizabeth has said to us this morning. <clears throat> 